Okay. Bless you. Come up. Okay. Okay. So it's uh, good to be with you uh, again. Uh, last time I was here, I had this big shining light in my face, and you were watching it on uh, your uh, YouTube. Uh, but today we have a live service, uh, so that's good. Um, I'll just open with a word of prayer, and then we're having a special um, introduction of, of music. So, so let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, uh, we come before you at this time. We want to thank you for this opportunity of meeting in your house and to uh, commune with you and to commune with each other. We just pray for your presence and blessing upon this beautiful Lord's Day. We pray also for a blessing upon um, this, this, uh, this congregation as they, as they have called uh, a brand new uh, pastor who's accepted the call. Uh, we pray that the transition would go off uh, very smoothly and that you would bless them with the abundance of your spirit. We pray this all in Jesus' name alone. Amen. Okay, well, thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, the call to worship you can find on your, your sheet there. Um, it comes from Psalm 100, very well uh, known psalm. It used to be called very fondly the Old 100th. Uh, so let's go through this uh, together. Uh, shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. We worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. For the Lord is good, and His love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Praise now we'll sing, uh, sing praise to God who reigns and for the beauty of the earth.
you may be seated, and we'll go through the prayer of confession and then the assurance of pardon. So the prayer of confession for this morning. Almighty God, you are eternal, gracious, loving, and steadfast. We come into your presence knowing that your mercy is beyond our deserving. None of us is worthy of your tender care. We confess before you our sins of self-righteousness, pride, and possessiveness. Remove our blinders to our faults and increase our sensitivity to those around us. Renew your peace within us that we may approach you with confidence and serve you with joy. We ask it through your Son, our risen Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And the assurance of pardon comes to us from John 8, verse 34 to 36. Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now, a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Let us now respond to that by the singing of hymn number 225, And Can It Be, verses 1, 2, and 4. Amen. So the scripture reading can be found in Matthew 13, verses 24 to 30, which is the parable 
of uh, the weeds. Uh, you may remember way back when, in the beginning of this year, I started a new series on the parables. I didn't get too far. Last time I was here it was the day of Pentecost, so I did a sermon on that. Uh, but I'd like to go back to the series. Obviously, I'm not going to get too far into the series, but I think it would be beneficial for us to look at some of these parables of Jesus. So we're going to read Matthew 13, verse 24 to 30, and then we're going to read the explanation uh, from verse 36. Uh, uh, that doesn't make any sense, does it? Uh, and then we read the explanation uh, further on here. Uh, Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed seeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the uh, weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling the weeds, you may root up the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will uh, tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burnt, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. And then we begin again with verse 36. Uh, then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, the one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the seeds of the evil one, and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burnt in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will weed out of his kingdom everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, uh, let him hear. So this parable uh, generates and, and answers or seeks to answer uh, three questions about evil. And of course the first one is the dilemma of evil. How could a good God uh, allow evil to enter uh, his creation? Remember, uh, the good seed uh, comes from the Son of God. Uh, he is good. He is a fountain of all good. The second one is uh, the presence of evil. Why doesn't God destroy the evil in this world at once? He said, let them both grow up and together until the time of harvest. And then, of course, the final question to be answered is the annihilation of evil. How, how evil will be destroyed and taken out of this cosmos, and there will be a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. So Jesus told them another parable. I remember these parables are everyday uh, occurrences for them, but also for us. We can never rid uh, the ground of all weeds. So it's a constant uh, battle in our life physically to weed our gardens, uh, but also when we look within our hearts, there's also weeds of sin constantly growing there that has to be taken care of. And then, of course, when we look around this world, it's filled with evil. So the question is, where did this evil come from? The Greeks, well, they couldn't figure it out. So they said everything we see, everything we touch, everything we taste is evil. And therefore, we, our souls, they come from God or the gods, so they are pure. So our, our soul is imprisoned by the evilness of our flesh. And of course, that's why people like Augustine, as reformed as he was, he had very much that Greek thought that he had to get away from the evil of this world, and he goes into a monastery. Uh, they didn't fully understand that they were having a dichotomy uh, between the things that they see uh, in the spiritual world. And there doesn't have to be a dichotomy between both of those things. The Jews, they said that our human existence is both spiritual and physical. A thousand years later, Martin Luther comes out of the monastery, and because he had beaten up his flesh so much, thinking if he would beat up his flesh, his soul would be saved, his soul would be pure, but somehow there was no connection between beating up his flesh and being holy in the sight of a holy God. 
until he learned that by faith he is justified through what Christ has done both in body and in soul. So our Reformed confessions begin on the right foot when they ask the very first question, well, what is your comfort in life and death? That I with soul and body, not just my soul, neither just not my body, the people that just live for this world, but soul and body are together. And that's why in the great day of the resurrection, they will be reunited and God will annihilate all evil that is on the face of the earth. So when Martin Luther came out of his monastery, he actually enjoyed life for the first time, but he couldn't enjoy it as much as he would have been able to enjoy it if he hadn't beaten up on his flesh. He had destroyed his inside digestive system so much through so rigorous fasting that he had trouble uh, in the flesh uh, for the rest of his days. But he would go out and preach a, a sermon and then he would go to the local pub and enjoy a good beer, like the Jews would say, thank God for the fruit of the vine. And he would say, this is not a joke, this is true. And he would say, I've done my job, now it's up to the Holy Spirit to do his job. There was no dichotomy when he came out of the monastery between the things he saw and tasted and experienced and, and the spiritual truths in God's word. He actually began to enjoy life. So the question is, um, where did the evil come from? Um, and, 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 and the uh, servants asked, the servants asked, but, but where did this evil come from? Uh, didn't, you, um, didn't you grow good, uh, uh, sow good seeds in the field, which is, uh, which is, the, uh, which is the world? And uh, the, the, the uh, owner of the field said, um, well, uh, so they asked, where do these weeds come from? And he said, an enemy had did the, ha, has done this. And where did this enemy come in? Verse 25. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came, out, came and sowed weeds among the wheat. Now, I, I think you're all very familiar uh, with... Um, the, the, the Genesis account, and, and I think this is a very conservative reform uh, congregation, that you do believe in the six-day creation account. And at the end of every day, God saw that everything was good. And on the seventh day, he rested and he rejoiced in his handiwork. And we are called to do the same, not only in creation, but also in grace and salvation. The reason why our forefathers called for a day of rest and why Jesus, God, called for a day of rest for the children of Israel, even going through the wilderness and collecting manna, they had to learn that their livelihood and their health and wealth, not only of their bodies, but also their souls, depended on God. There was one day they were not going to add to the productivity of their existence, but they were actually going to rest and reflect on who God is, what He has done, and what He's promised to do in His Word. And we can use this day for recreation in nature, uh, to rest with our bodies, and we can also use this day to rest in our souls, to reacquaint our souls with the promises of God's Word. But he says, um, while everyone was sleeping. So you read of the account, not so much in Genesis, but I believe it's in the book of Job, that when God created everything, all the hosts of heaven rejoiced and sung for joy. But there was a fly in the ointment, and it was worse than a fly. It was a snake. Now, we, we think that the snake slithered into paradise. But actually, many uh, Bible scholars believe that the snake actually walked on its tail. Uh, because when God cursed the uh, snake, it says, from now on you will slither on your belly in the dust of the earth. But nobody, including Adam and Eve, and I believe in a sense the angels, expected to see this evil one come to sow thorns or weeds or thistles amongst the goodness of that garden. The angels were rejoicing, God was resting, Adam and Eve were rejoicing in the relationship, a pure relationship with God. And this snake on his tail comes walking into the garden and begins to talk uh, to the first couple. And you know 
uh, what happened. You know that the rest is history. The, the dilemma of evil, evil. But the question could be raised, well, why did God even allow that possibility? Well, of course, I think we realize that if Adam and Eve could do nothing else but, but be perfect, and there was absolutely no opportunity, there was no free will to do anything else but to love God, that's not true love. Love has to be a volition of your, of your character and your will and your resolve. We live in a very Hollywood romantic age of love, but love requires discipline. Love requires a resolve of the will. Love requires determination. Love in this fallen world requires that we say no to certain things. And that's love. Love is not this, this, this mushy feeling of romance and everything's going to go my way. No, God wanted to show to all creation the masterpiece of His creation that He willingly served God. But there was one identity or one creature or one spiritual being at that time who had revolted from God. It's called the evil one, the devil. And he, of course, was out to smash, to smotherings, the very masterpiece of God's creation. And he slithers into the garden and walks into the garden while everyone was asleep. Nobody was expecting it. The first couple, the angels weren't expecting it. And God allowed it because he wanted to prove to himself and to the evil one that Adam freely wanted to love God. But that's not exactly what happened. And that, of course, is the dilemma of evil, which we probably can't fully understand uh, in this life. I am a chaplain. I've said that probably every sermon I've come here. But it, it's part of my identity, and I deal with the brokenness and the end of life. And I've often wondered why God just didn't annihilate, just didn't, like when Aaron's sons brought false fire before the Lord, they were consumed. Why didn't he just consume Adam and Eve, and just bring forth another couple and try again. Well, then Satan would have had the master, would have had the mastery. So he not only allows Satan to do it, he also allows Satan to continue to do it, to continue his evil works upon the face of the earth. So now we have to deal with the evil that's within us evil that's around us and the evil that's going to be there until the end of time. And rather than destroy the first couple and start all over, God promises that He Himself will pay for the first couple's sin. God was not content just to bring forth a beautiful, we, we've sung it together, the beauty of the earth, the beauty of His creation. We were just up in, um, or down in, in Washington, Virginia, uh, visiting uh, my son. And um, yes, it, it's, it's, it's very congested there, obviously, but we went to some, some uh, natural parks and so forth. And, and, and wherever you go, the beauty of creation, the beauty of the green trees, the beauty of the green grass, and the heat of the sun, the beauty of the meandering uh, 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 and rolling waters uh, falling down the rocks, how great thou art! But God wanted to show himself even greater. I believe there was no way that he could fully express his love to mankind, but to allow them to fall and say, I will fix the problem. I will take that curse upon myself. I will give my only begotten son, so that whosoever believes in him will be redeemed from the curse of sin. And that tiny promise, that tiny seed of promise that the seed of the, of the woman would crush the seed of the evil one began in the brokenness of that garden. But now God gets the glory not only of creation, but also of, uh, we say recreation, but also of salvation and eventually uh, recreation. But then we have the, the dilemma. What do we do with the evil around us? The servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up, the weeds? 
But he answered, no. Because while you're pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. You know, if you're in the garden, sometimes in the very beginning when plants are very tiny, you really don't know if they're a plant or a, um, or a, we uh, a weed. Of course, today with modern agriculture, uh, we will plant the seeds and then we will use a, a germicide or whatever, a uh, weedicide, uh, like Roundup. I don't know if that's still uh, allowed, but the, for a long time they did that. Uh, to spray about a week after the seed was sown so that when the seeds come up, they get a head start. They're above and beyond the weeds. But we, we don't get a head start. We conceive our children and our own image. And Adam begat a son or sons in his own image. And the first one, the firstborn rose up and slew the secondborn. That was the first, uh, first family that inhabited this, uh, the face of the earth. That's why we have the covenant of infant baptism, to lay our claim upon God's promise that He will protect the seed of His Word within the hearts of our children so that they won't grow up as a weed, but they will grow up as a child of God, dedicated and sworn by God Himself that He would bless them and pour His love upon them. Let them both grow up together. That's the dilemma that we face today. Now, if you read the book of Psalms, the psalmist was filled with rage and envy and, and, uh, and judgment upon all his enemies. And his basic cry, cry was, Lord, destroy every enemy before they destroy us. And when we see the violence that is happening in the earth today, I'm just going through some meditations in the Holland home, uh, and I've chosen uh, Noah. And, and why was that first earth destroyed? Because of the violence that was in the earth. And why will this earth be destroyed? Because of the violence that is within the earth. But here we're told, let them both grow up together. My question to you is, can the weeds harm the wheat? Can the tares or the weeds harm the good seed, the good plants? Well, I guess, uh, I guess in a sense, if it's a poorly nourished garden with a poor gardener and there's not many nutrients in the soil, the plant will not grow very good and weeds don't need the same nutrients as plants. But you would expect in the vineyard of the Lord, which is the church, when we're raised and molded with the truth and we're engrafted in a sense, at least in a confessional way, into the riches of Christ Jesus that we should grow and tower above the weeds because we're connected to the source of all life. Now, it doesn't mean to say when you water your garden or you throw fertilizer on your garden or your lawn that you can't exactly stop the dandelions from growing. They benefit from the water too. They benefit from the rain too. They benefit from the nourishment of the soil too. They benefit from the fertilizer as well. They benefit from the care that you give them. And that's why in the very church of God, there is wheat and chaff. That's why in the very well today, there are weeds that grow, and some of them can be filled with something of the image and wisdom of God because there is a connection to God. But weed, uh, sorry, but plants should normally... We don't grow, a, we're not into a harvest of weeds, we're into a harvest of wheat. And we will see to it that the wheat flourishes even though there may be weeds there. So what's our, what's our relationship to the weeds? If you're a wheat, if you're from the sun, uh, from, the, from, the, from the good seed, and you're bearing fruit in His name, can you become a weed? No, you can't. And if you're a weed bearing fruits in the name of the evil one, can you become a plant? Well, to become a plant, your DNA has to be changed. And that's why whether you're a churchgoer or you're not a churchgoer, if you know to speak the, the language of the holy people and the saints, but it's not in your heart like it wasn't in the heart of Nicodemus, we do have to listen to what Jesus said. Accept 
you're born again. Your DNA spiritually is altered and changed completely. You go from a weed that is outside the, 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 the barn or the garner or, or the husbandry of God to a plant. But once a plant, we can never change into a weed. Our DNA is inherently different. Now, we may not be a very healthy plant. We may not be very vigorous in our growth. If we don't spend a lot of time with the Lord, if we let the weeds in our hearts grow up to shade the light of the sun so the plant doesn't get the sunlight, we could almost be on the brink of losing our spiritual vitality. And we have to ask ourselves, where are we in that relationship? But if we are a healthy, vigorous plant, which we would, should be, and we grow above the weeds, what happens? Perhaps we're a sunflower, beautiful. And, and we have the glory of creation in our DNA to reflect the beauty and the goodness and the grace of God. But what does a sunflower do? It has broad, plant, broad, broad weed, uh, leaves. It shades the weeds so the weeds can't grow. So what are we called to do? We are called to be the salt and the light of this world. God purposely has planted us in an evil world so we can be the salt and the, and, and the light of this world. And I'm afraid, and I'll include, include myself, I've just, it just dawned upon me, we spend too much time trying to redeem our old nature, to make it better. We spend too much time on trying to redeem the evils of this world through finances, through economy, through education, uh, through uh, racial segregation. Now, I'm not saying uh, uh, desegregation, I mean, amalgamation. Um, I'm not saying these things are not helpful. But in and of itself, we can be a very flourishing weed, but our DNA is still a weed. We are called to be light and salt. We are called to redeem the world through the salvation of God. That is a decided change. That is no moral, um, moral education or, or, or pouring lots and lots of money into certain areas, saying it's a lack of finances, it's a lack of education, it's a lack of opportunities. And yes, statistics show you can give this education, you can give these opportunities, and yet if the heart is not right with God, it's still going to be bring forth fruits of the evil one. We spend too much time trying to redeem the evilness of our nature. You know what the Bible tells us to do? It tells us not to do the works of the flesh, the works of our broken nature, but to clothe ourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. In Colossians 3, it tells us to clothe ourselves with meekness, with humbleness, with joy, with gentleness, with compassion, with patience. Or why do we clothe ourselves? To cover up the nakedness and the rawness of our broken nature. It can't be redeemed. We have to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. We have to shine as lights. We have to be the salt of the earth. We have to be winsome in our character and our nature. As Jesus Christ said to the woman at the well, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink, and I can give you waters that you will never thirst of again. There's a reason why we're planted in the midst of an evil world that can't be redeemed. That is our mission field. We will never lose our DNA as a plant of God's planting, especially if we're vibrant and vigorous in the faith and in, in, in the walk and talk. And we will, hopefully through our influence, overshadow the weeds so, so their influence isn't so great. And they can, you imagine, this is imaginary, a sunflower and a weed talking to each other. Well, what do you have to show for yourself? Look at my beautiful flowers that reflect the glory of God. Well, I don't have those flowers. Well, I, I drink in all the nourishment, all the water that God gives me. 
ah, I don't like a rainy day. I just like the sun. And I burn up and I frizzle up in the sun. There's nothing beautiful about me. How do I become a beautiful flower like you that reflects the goodness, the love, the patience, the mercy, the grace of God, both in rainy days and in sunshine weather? How, do I, how, how can I have a more consistent walk uh, with my spouse and with my family and with my church members? How can I do that? Well, we can say you must be born again. Well, well, you must be born again. But how are you born again? What does Jesus do to Nicodemus? He preaches the gospel. The catechism says we are engrafted into Christ. We're cut off from that first Adam. Your root is in the wrong place. It's just in all the goodies of this world. It's just in the brokenness of human nature. Every government, unless you have a God-fearing government, is absolutely rooted in the brokenness and the fallibility of this nature. And therefore, I stand on this podium today in this Reformed church and say, unless governments embrace the God, the fear of God and their legislation and then their walk and their talk, there is no fixing of humanity. The fear of God is the beginning of all wisdom. What's the fear of God? To have the right attitude towards God. I believe there's four reasons, and I have to hasten on here, but there's four reasons why um, we are to let the weeds grow with the wheat. The first one is, of course, if you're a good tree, you're going to bring forth good fruit. So we have to show the good fruits of God's love in our life. The second one is, in Luke 13, it talks about repentance, and it talks about this tree that's not bringing forth much fruit. And the the master says, well, just hew it down. For three years I've come looking for fruit, and I find none. Just hew it down. And the servant says, well, let me dig and dung around it for another year. If it bears no fruit, then hew it down. There's a reason why the the weeds are still growing. God wants to be merciful. God wants to show His love. God wants to show His grace. God wants to show the power of regeneration that we're connected to another root, the life-saving root of Jesus Christ, our Lord. The third reason is why we have to let them grow together is because, and that's the whole purpose of this parable, is we're not called to judge. If you were a fly on the wall, in, the, in, the, uh, in that prayer, prayer room or sanctuary or synagogue, the synagogue where the Pharisee and the tax collector, the Pharisee came right up here, just where I am. The Pharisee came right up the front. And he had a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful prayer. And he said all the things that you expected him to say if you were from that culture. Not for reform, but from that culture. And then the, the tax collector, he's way, way in the back there, kind of hiding in himself mumbling under his breath. He's like a fly in the ointment. Like he doesn't belong there. And you would say, what's that tax collector doing here? Is he trying to make rights for his wrongs? Is he trying to redeem himself? And yet the Bible tells us he is the one that goes home justified. I believe God sees grace where we don't see grace. If you see a little tiny speck of grace in someone's life and everything else is upside down, they would say, all the furniture's in the house, but it's not in the right place. Justification, sanctification, glorification, spending time with the Lord. But you see the seed of grace. Don't trample it on, down. Don't come with all your legalism where you must go to this church and you must read this book and you must spend time with the Lord. No, gently nourish and, and water that tender plant that perhaps is being raised in the shadow and the shade of your broad leaf. Remember what Psalm 1 says? The one that fears the Lord is like a tree, a nourishing, sheltering tree, nurturing tree that saplings grow under. And that's what we're called to be, to nurture the saplings of the beginning of God's grace. And the final one is, We don't fully understand the purpose of everything. But you do have to understand before the beginning, we were not there. You know know how you explain to your children and and when they're three or four, but where did I come from? But but before I was born, where where, 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 where was I? And if we're a Christian, we say, well, you were in the heart of God. You were in the thoughts of God. 
but how, how does it be that all of a sudden I'm here? Right? Well, we weren't there in the beginning either. But in many ways, it is a competition between God and the evil one, because he rebelled. And whatever he does with people, both God and this evil one, they're out to show for themselves their power. And God's like, okay, you can do whatever you like to Job. He's not going to lose your faith. You want to bet? I'm going to show you who he is. But he doesn't, does he? And I don't know how the devil attacks you. I was talking to a lady uh, a few weeks ago. She says, it's not helpful waking up. When you get older, you don't always sleep so well. She says, it's not helpful waking up in the middle of the night. Some of the thoughts that come to your mind, they're just not helpful. Well, I believe that's the prince of darkness' time. But he's out to destroy you. He's out to, 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 to enlarge his kingdom. But God's going to grow his kingdom right in the territory of enemies' kingdom. He said, the gates of death shall not prevail against the confession of Peter who said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. You are the fountain of all life, the fountain of all love, the fountain of all hope. And when we're not connected with that, when governments don't see that, it spells disaster. We can have all the socialistic schemes we like, but there's something wrong deep, deep, deep within us. We have to be cut off from the first Adam and engrafted into the second. And then finally, of course, the animal for evil to be annihilated. When will that happen? At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and bind them into bundles and burn them. In Matthew 25, we read, Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. The triumph of the kingdom. Then gather the wheat and bring them into my barn. We can make life so much more easier for ourselves if we don't spend so much energy in judging if we don't spend so much energy in trying to redeem the evils of this world, we can't redeem them. But spend energy walking and talking with your God. Spend energy walking and talking with unbelievers. Not in a judgmental kind of a way. Not in a legalistic kind of a way. Not in a way that says, well, look at me. I have my act together. You poor soul, you're broken. Well, so am I. And I stand up here as a broken person parading the grace of God. It breaks my heart sometimes when I see how broken I am, when I see how broken church people are, and they have this facade of self-righteousness and self-holiness, and yet we're all poor sinners drinking from the fountain of life. And I love this very last uh, uh, verse here in verse 43. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who has ears, let him hear. Jesus says, I stand at the door and I knock. The one who hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and will sup with him and he with me. The one who perseveres will sit on my throne even as I sit on my father's throne. We shall inherit in glory. It's not in this world. We cannot make a Christian world out of a broken world. Augustine, the city of light and the city of darkness, the city on a hill, the city of God and the city of the evil one. It goes on uh, over a thousand years later, 15 years, 100 years later, the story of Augustine is being worked out in our life. We're not called to mow the weeds down. We're called to love our enemies we're called to reflect the love and the mercy of God. God says, I, I put up with the weeds and the evil of this world so that they will repent. If they don't know a godly person, how are they going to repent? We can't just put a track on their door. We can't just tell them to read the Bible, although that can be useful. The most powerful way that people come to the Lord Jesus Christ is through the personal testimony and the personal love of other people. And if you cannot share the word with them, certainly you can share the love of Jesus with them. There's a reason, even through the valley of the shadow of evil, 
I will be with you until I will bring you home into my body. And we want as many people as possible to come home to live forever with the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know as well as I am, no, it's not much fun being a weed. There's, there's, no, there's no satisfaction in it. There's no, there's, there's no life. There's no sustenance in it. But man, it's, it's great to be a child of God. That sunflower that's reflecting all the energy of the sun, it absorbs it and it grows and it's beautiful to see a field filled with sunflowers. And that's what God has called us to be, the children of light. Amen. So let's just have a brief word of prayer. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, uh, we come before you at this time, and uh, we want to thank you for this time together uh, in the Word of God. We want to thank you that you are the good one that planted the good seeds. Uh, we pray, O oh Lord, uh, that we would continue to be nourished by your great goodness, your love, your mercy, your grace, to drink in uh, the water of life, to absorb the sunshine of your grace, to grow strong and vigorously, to overshadow the power of evil through the power of good, and to know that you will never leave us nor forsake us, even in 2020, and soon it will be 2021. We pray for, in a very special way for this dear congregation that will receive a new pastor. It's always a time of uh, anticipation, O oh Lord, and we just pray that you would grace this young man uh, with the spirit of your word and of your grace, the spirit of the gospel, uh, the spirit of faith and joy and hope. Be with him and his family as they transition uh, to New Jersey. And we do pray for northern New Jersey. We pray for all of New Jersey. But indeed, uh, we can feel sometimes that we're inundated with evil. We're inundated with brokenness. Governments do not know what to do. The church knows what to do. But the church is often sleeping. This church is often sluggish. The church often has a mixed message, O oh Lord. But we pray that you would fill the churches with the power of the risen Jesus, with the confession of Peter. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are the fountain of all life. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would bless your word to be an operative living word in our hearts and in the hearts of broken humanity. We pray this all in Jesus' name alone. Amen. So we're going to respond by joy to the world. Now, that's not a mistake. Uh, I know I come from down under, so we could have Christmas in July. Um, but um, as far as the curse is found, what's going to happen? God's kingdom shall rule and shall reign, and he shall pick up all the, all the curses and all the weeds and bind them into bundles and remove them from this earth, and there shall be new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Joy to the world.
Amen. Hallelujah. The Lord is coming back. Rather than a benediction today, I'd like to read some words of the prayer of our Lord Jesus Christ uh, before he goes to the cross. He prays these words. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by, by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. Brothers and sisters, be in this world, but not part of this world. And be sanctified through the truth that comes to us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.